And in Joshua chapter 3, um, we're going to attempt to go over the whole chapter. I don't know how that's going to work. We might have to park it somewhere in between. But um, on the, This message I'm going to preach is called On the Royal Road to Blessing. So, obviously we got Joshua now. He's the front man. Moses is done gone on to be with the Lord. Joshua's already sent his spies out to Jericho. They came back, and now it's time to move. Now it's time to move. So, Joshua now, uh, we see in verse 1, he rises up early. It says, and Joshua rose early in the morning. Well, on this royal road to blessing, amen, which is really just Joshua following what God said, he needs to get to this land of Canaan. He needs to be following God just like anybody. You know, and but on this road called God's will, it's never some easy path. Um, spoke with a lady this morning and she's telling me it's always God's will for somebody to get healed and I had to pause her and say, Well, why did Paul die a sick man? Why was he being followed around by Luke the physician at the end of his death? Then I mean, you have to take up that conversation with Paul the Apostle. You know, and she said, well, by his stripes we're healed. And I'm like, yeah, of sin. You know, and you can't say that it's never God's will for you to get sick because God uses sickness in the Bible. Jesus uses sickness in the Bible. Uh, there's a number of reasons for sickness. One of them... Uh, they said, you know, why is this boy sick? Is it his parents' fault? And he said, no, it's for the glory of God. So sometimes you can have hardship in your life because of the glory of God. And, I mean, you can be in the perfect will of God. You're on the royal road to blessing, and yet it's paved with rocks and splinters and thorns. And you're like, but God, I thought this is exact. You're exactly where I want you, boy. Keep coming, keep coming. But this is hard. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. Keep coming. I'm going to get you through. You know, and uh, it's kind of like, I don't know if you guys have done much hiking, but I've been on some <laughs> weird hikes where the trails have been washed out, and they're like, no, no, it's this way. And you're like, this doesn't look like a path to anywhere. Like, no, it's right over there, right over there. So you keep going, you keep going, and you get to the top of the mountain there, and see, this is where it is. And you start looking around, and you're like, of course, this is so beautiful right here. This was worth the whole trip. And really, that's how walking in God's will is. You know, I mean, you're going to be stubbing your toes, scraping your knees, and, and you're in the perfect will of God. You know, and uh, so the royal road to blessings is very narrow, and yet has all the freedom in the world. It's often rocky, yet it's the safest place to be. Um, in Joshua chapter 3, we're going to look how Joshua followed God's perfect will into war with Jericho. You know, so I mean, this is really interesting, right? I mean, it was God's perfect will for him to go headlong into a war with Jericho. It might be God's perfect will for you to go headlong into war with a family man. I don't know. But it's not always how we perceive things to be. We quoted the verse this morning. You know, God says, my ways are not your ways. My ways are above your ways. And uh, so here in Joshua chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim, and came to Jordan, and he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. So our first point we're going to look at is you've got to get the show on the road to blessings. You've got to move. You've got to do something. And uh, so we see that on the road early, that they rose early. Joshua was the type of guy that would just wake up early, you know, and just want to get stuff going on. And I don't know if, if you're that type of guy. I mean, I, I'm, I try to be that type of guy most of the time. And it seems like when I don't, when I sleep in, I'm often kicking myself in the pants. Like, why did I sleep in 30 minutes or 45 minutes? It's like... You know, you're spending the rest of the day trying to catch up or something, but, you know, I, I guess there's those old phrases, the early bird catches the worm, you know, and I think there's a lot of truth in that. I think there's a lot of truth in that. Let me give you some Bible examples. Let's look at Exodus chapter 9. Let's look at, at Moses. 
Exodus chapter 9 and verse 13. Before Moses goes to stand before Pharaoh. Man, I would want to uh, sleep in that day. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, how about next week, Lord, right? We're in Exodus 9.13. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say unto him. <coughs> so Moses had to rise up early. We're here in Joshua chapter 3, verse 1. He had to rise up early. You see? What about 1 Kings 17? 1 Kings 17. Remember Elijah? 1 Kings 17 and verse 6. This is... Uh, and it says here in 1 Kings 17, 6, And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. So he had to get up in the morning. See? Now, I understand, you know, some people have to work at night or whatever, but the point is, make time to make time. And we can't just sleep our whole life away. And, you know, I mean, Jesus, he, he rebuked his disciples, you know, for falling asleep. And you, you think about how you used to be in the world and how you'd get up early for things of the world, how you'd stay up late for things of the world. Why can't you do the same for Jesus as far as just that goes? You know, um, if, if church goes a little too late, which I, I try to be mindful of the time, most of the time, uh, but I mean, some people after the 30 minute mark, they're, they're gone mentally and they're just, or falling asleep or whatever. But, you know, the, the point is we need to put God first, right? And it's biblical to raise up early. Just like Joshua did in Joshua chapter 3. Why? Why rise up early? Because great things happen in the morning. Amen? Uh, look at 1 Samuel chapter 5. 1 Samuel chapter 5. First Samuel chapter 5. In verse 4, and it says, And when they arose early on the morrow, on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. Now, if you remember this, this is when the ark of the covenant got stolen, put in the Philistines' camp. And man, just to make a mockery out of God, out of out of the Jews, God's God's people, you know, they, they put the ark right in the temple of Dagon. They're uh, well, I guess that's uh, some type of fish god. I've had somebody, I've had somebody draw a parallel between the uh, fish god Dagon and the Starbucks picture, but whatever that means. But, but anyway, Dagon fell upon its face, and when did that happen? In the morning. You know, if you would have slept in that day, I mean, you would have just heard people talking about it. But if you would have got up early, you could have seen it yourself. You know, and um, now. The ark um, might not feel near, but wait till the morning. You know, and, and when when you're going through tough stuff in your life, you know, you'll go through nighttime periods in your life where it's cold, where it's dark, where it's miserable. And you know what? Good things happen in the morning. You know, his mercy's renewed every morning, the Bible says. And I mean, talking to a young young man this uh, last week. He's telling me he wants to kill himself. You know, he's in a dark time in his life. And he just needs to wait until the morning. You know, I mean, uh, I don't know if you've ever been there. I've been there where I've, I just felt like, God, just kill me, you know. And But, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not willing to go forward and take my own life. But, I mean, I'm just like, God, kill me. There's, I got nothing else to offer this world. You know, and yet I wake up in the morning. And it's like God saying, there's something else for you to do. And I'm like, well, I'll, I don't know. What is it, sweeping floors? Or, I mean, I could sweep a mean floor, man. But, you know, so you just feel like you can't do much more than that. But, you know, but God gives you a reason to live. Amen. And oftentimes in that, the cold of the dark night, you, 
you just don't see it. But then in the morning, you're like, you know what? I got new mercy now. He, he, he gave me a refill, praise the Lord, <laughs> you know? And uh, so Dagon was put out of service in the morning. The Assyrian army seized in the morning in 2 Kings 19.35. It says, And it came to pass uh, that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote the camp of the Assyrians, 104 score and 5,000. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. You know, there's this reoccurring thing in the Bible of waking up early in the morning. Look over in Proverbs 30, verse 5. Proverbs 30, verse 5. You know, sometimes we just skip over what's being said in the Bible, what's being said in the Word of God, and we're like, oh, it's just Joshua just waking up just like any other day. No, God's trying to build upon a foundation, and the foundation here is something about getting up early in the morning. In Proverbs 30, verse 5, it says, for his anger endureth but a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh once again in the morning. Uh, in Lamentations 3.22, I'll read this one. It says, Amen. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassion fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. They're new every morning. And we need every ounce of them. You know? So, great enemies also rise in the morning. And, and if you're not going to rise up, well, well, don't think that your enemies aren't going to. Look at Isaiah 14. You probably know where I'm going with this. Isaiah 14, famous for the five I will statements of Lucifer the devil. And in Isaiah 14, verse 12. <laughs> Get right with Jesus. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the what? The, the morning. morning. Son of the morning. Hmm. That's interesting. And uh, you know what? Look over in Revelation 22, 16. You know, if you're familiar with the perverted Bibles and what, what they do, you're probably... Uh, familiar with what they do with Jesus because they, they change they change that uh, phrase, that title of the devil in Isaiah 14 to match Jesus in Revelation 22, 16. And it says this. It says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. See, we got a morning star too. You know, and I, I don't know if you've taken too much time to look into the similarities between Jesus and the devil. I mean, they're, they're amazingly similar. You know, we have the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, uh, Jesus is, is the bright and morning star. And then the devil there in, in Isaiah 14, 12 is the son of the morning. I mean, if you don't have this word of God, I mean, sure enough, he can disguise himself as an angel of light and you wouldn't know any better. That's why it's so crucial to have every word of God. Amen. Amen. So um, then back in Joshua chapter 3, there's a rest stop in Jordan. And it says, uh, Joshua 3, verse 1, And Joshua rose early in the morning, they were moved from Shittim, and came to Jordan. And he and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. So this goes to show you that in life, Mays Jackson said it like this, old-fashioned preacher, old preacher, he said, in life you're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or going into a storm. So, I mean, you might not be in a storm right now, but that means you're getting ready to head into one. Or you might be in a storm, but that means you're getting ready to get out, you see? Or you might be getting out of a storm, you see? And you think about what these children of Israel have been through. Think about what Joshua has been through with Moses. I mean, just problem after problem after problem. 
Now he's getting ready to go face headlong into war. And he's in God's will. So he takes a rest stop. Now, in Luke 4, 1, it says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, this is interesting, too, because Jesus was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness for what? To be tempted of the devil. To be tempted of the devil. Oh, well, I mean, God's will would never be anything bad. I mean, for you. I mean, hey, man, you might not see it as good right now. I mean, yeah, but there, there's, there's promise in bleeding. There's promise in br getting bruised up. I mean, there's promise in, in learning. I mean, hey, man, you catch a right hook a couple times. You know what? What will never get you again? A right hook. Cause you're just going to be looking for it every chance, I mean, you get. And, but Jesus Christ, I mean, he was led of the Spirit into that wilderness to be tempted of the devil. To be starved. And we just need to realize this world is not our home, so we can't get too comfortable. Amen? And even with, with Joshua walking, walking uh, came to Jordan, and he and all the children of Israel lodged there before they passed over. You can't get too comfortable. You know, uh, I think a lot of people get too comfortable here. You know, they, they get too dependent on, on their things. And it's kind of like that scary hoarders TV show or something where, I mean, these people, they just hold on to these things and things and things. And, I mean, praise the Lord, you know, I mean, we, we live little. But, I mean, when you live little, it kind of, you see it quicker. You're like, why am I attached to this? What is this? It's just a thing. It's a piece of cloth or, or it's just a material thing. Why do I need this? I haven't touched it for five years. You know, I mean, why sacrifice the space for this? And I mean, I'm just thinking of this one I saw years ago, this hoarder's thing, and this lady, there was this empty shampoo bottle. And she's like, <laughs> I'm just near, I don't... And it's just like, you're crazy. <laughs> you're crazy, you know? I mean, but this is the... Man, if, if we have that eternal perspective, we won't get so stuck to this stuff. You know what? Yeah, you, you get burned at work. Amen. I'm not going to be here forever. You know, I'm just passing through. But guess what? If that's all you got, oh yeah, you'll fight tooth and nail to the bitter end. You know, I mean, we were talking this morning about a man having a ruined reputation. He wasn't thinking of things on this earth. He was thinking about heavenly things. Mm -hmm. And uh, who cares? You know, I mean, uh, I'm sure you've had situations where uh, your name would be brought up in a weird way. And sure enough, man, you, you can fight that thing to the bitter end. Amen. But think about all the time that's going to be wasted, the effort that's going to be wasted on people that will never change anyway. And it's just like, you know what? Why don't you just focus on pleasing God? Why don't you just focus on pleasing the Lord? Because you can never reason with the unreasonable. And that's just what it comes down to. You know, um, I, think, I think it was Paul that said, you know, am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? If that's how it's got to be, then that's how it's going to be. I told you the truth at least. You know, so let all the rest do whatever they need to. So we're back in Joshua chapter 3. Let's look at verse 2 through 6. It says, And it came to pass that after three days that the officers went through the hosts, and they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests and the Levites bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about two thousand cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way uh, by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. And we're going to go to six. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. 
And Joshua spake unto the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. So on the royal road to blessing, you can get a, the blessing of a good driver discount, you know, by following the rules. You know, uh, you go in to get insurance these days, and you don't have any speeding tickets, they give you a break. You know, and uh, that's just with earthly minds. How much more with God when, when you're walking the walk, not just talking the talk, but you're walking, you're living holy, you're living righteous, or attempting to as much as you can, you're sacrificing, God's going to give you a little discount here and there. He's going to bless you. He's going to throw some stuff your way. And it's from being controlled on the road and following things like the speed limit, right? It, t it takes being attentive to the speedometer, right? When, when you're on that road, man, that's hard. And being aware of the speed limit signs. And here we see Joshua is not in a hurry, but was actually patient and moving everyone. See, Joshua could have said, come on, guys, let's go. There's women, there's children. Hey, pick it up a little bit. You know, God's leading us over Jordan, but he takes time to park it, and he takes time to rest. See, like, like that old phrase, uh, Satan rushes and God guides. You know, I mean, if, if there's too much of a push, you can pretty much guarantee it's, it's not God. Like, you get those telemarketers or something on the phone, if you tell me right now while we're on the phone, you know, yes, then you'll get, it's like, hey man, I can't talk to my wife about it. You're telling me I can't pray about it. I can't even wait 24 hours. No, I need to know right now. Well, the answer is no. You see, I mean, God doesn't work like that. God doesn't work like that. Um, <clears throat> Joshua's not in a hurry because now he's taking into account the flock of God that he's now leading. You know, and, and he's for years and years watched Moses and watch how, I mean, hey man, he wasn't perfect, but he's a picture of a, of a good pastor. He had a pastor's heart. Anytime judgment was going to come to the people, Moses is like, judge me, God. Judge me, not the people. I mean, that's a pastor's heart. But you know what? There was no rush in verse 2. It says, and it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host. They waited three days. I mean, they're at the brink of Jordan. Just look, right there on the other side, right there. That's where we're supposed to be. Oh, um, we'll wait a couple more days. You know, pray. Pray on it. Give it to God. Make sure we're being led by the Spirit, not by our flesh. You know, and uh, see, God in, in life, He sets up the speed limits. Amen? Because all the roads are His. You know, and a lot of times... God's just testing you to see what you're going to do. I mean, I've seen, I've seen people called to ministries, quote unquote. You know, and then when something better comes along, they just abandon ship and go to something better. And it's like, but I thought you were called to that ministry. Oh yeah, but it wasn't very fruitful. And hey man, there's a lot more people over here. It's just like, you told me that God told you to be there. Oh yeah, well now I'm skipping state and we're going over here. A couple years later, oh, you're back now. What? What? I, I thought you were over there, but now you're here. Who are you following? You know, and God's not the author of confusion, but God sets the speed limits on the royal road to blessing. He's the owner. He he sets it up as a toll road or a freeway. Hey, Amen. You you can go down one road and you're gonna have to pay. It's quicker, but you'll pay. You know, or you can. Take the slow road, you know, the, the hard way, you know. And he can make the speed limit slow or fast. He's the author and the finisher of our freeway, you know. Well, not these freeways. These ones are ruined a lot of times. You're just <laughs> driving on them like that. But you don't have to follow speed limits. You don't have to follow turn signal rules. You don't have to follow any of that. But it'd be a lot smarter if you did, you know. And God wants you to think about that stuff while you're on the royal road to blessing. Every little decision matters. Every little decision. So he's the officer and the enforcer as well. But Joshua was found waiting on God in prayer. See, the hard thing about waiting on God in prayer 
is actually praying. That's the hardest thing. I don't know what it is, and if you've ever felt it, I definitely have, but when you're sitting in a situation and you know you should be praying, and there's just something keeping you from it. That's the devil, man. Yeah. I mean, I don't believe the devil is behind every bush, but I, I could definitely attribute... See, when you have an open phone line to God the Father through the blood of Jesus Christ, and you're not wanting to utilize it, why not? I mean, aren't you supposed to, even, even when things are going good, you're supposed to be thanking Him. He wants you on that phone line constantly. I mean, you know, he wants the selfie pictures, you know, of, of I mean, you know, he wants to see what you're eating. He wants to, he wants to Skype with you. I mean, you know, he just, when things are good, when things are bad, he just wants that constant communication. So we, you got to wait on God in prayer. And a lot of times uh, people might tell others that they're praying when they're really not. You know, and a good way to avoid that is just pray for them right then and there. That way you don't have to lie to them. Amen? But we must be constantly praying throughout the day. Keep that communication with God. I'm, I'm just thinking of, uh, Amen. of uh, Billy Sunday's song leader. I don't know if you guys, there's a video. He only has like a couple things put out. But if you ever seen that Billy Sunday video, his song leader is talking about what made Billy Sunday so great. I mean, Billy Sunday, this is a man that, he wouldn't come to a town unless all the churches agreed to not have service and all meet at that tabernacle. And when Billy Sunday would preach, all the liquor stores, all the saloons in the whole town would be shut down. It'd be a dry town when he left. I mean, what would give a person so much Holy Ghost power? And, and exactly. Exactly. Well, this is what happened. The song leader, he says, look, this is how Billy Sunday did it. And he said, you know, he'd be shaving in the morning. I'd walk, I'd walk by and kind of, you know, listen to what he's doing. And he, he, he said he heard Billy Sunday praying a prayer like, uh, God, I'm not sure what I'm going to preach today. He just talked to him just like Daddy. But there's a lot of hurting people out there. If, if you don't give me a message for these people, then I'm not really going to be much, worth much. You know, and uh, so even somebody like Billy Sunday, he realized he didn't have it all figured out. So some of these big time preacher men, you know, you think they, they never trip over their own shoelace the way they act. I mean, they, their clothes are all perfect. Their hair's all perfect. I mean, they're plucking their eyebrows. And a man that plucks his eyebrows, this is kind of different, man. This is kind of, I don't know. I don't, I'm just telling you. Men are not supposed to be effeminate. And you spend so much time on the way you look, what's the big deal, man? I mean, you could have probably taught John the Baptist a couple of things, huh? <laughs> you, you know, you, you think about how, uh, how tattered up and torn up Jesus was as he's getting ready to go to the cross. You could have probably told him a little something about hygiene, huh? You know, I mean, you think about your Lord and Savior. You think about, I mean, serious now. I'm just talking about if your goal was to just follow God, to preach, to teach, to see souls saved, I mean, to live in God's perfect will, I mean, maybe God wouldn't want you in a $400 suit. You ever think about that? Maybe God would want you in, in a, oh, what's, I'm trying to think of it, in a polyester suit. God forbid. Oh, they don't breathe very well at all. Who cares? Who cares? You know, and I don't know. I mean, there's better things to spend money on, I, I think. I mean, you, you know, some of these uh, pastor preachers, they need to take their wife out on a date. They haven't seen her in six months. Amen. You know, and I mean, Saunders, he's always warning me. He, he, he knows of a few good men, man, who've yes. fallen Amen. just because of that relationship with the wife. And I'm sure you know some, and I know some. But because that relationship with the wife is not being nurtured. And that is as serious as sin, man. That's serious. You know, and, and if you don't have the wife, your relationship with God is what you need to be nurturing. That's, that's a serious topic. Because the most important thing is not seeing souls saved. I know everyone says it is. The most important thing is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because you're not worth anything without it. Amen. That's good. 
So waiting on God in prayer. So let's look at what prayer is not. See, to understand what prayer is, let's look at what it's not first. So prayer is not speaking in tongues. If you were here last week, uh, we went in, into that. And speaking in tongues is not salvation. Amen. But tongues in the Bible is always an actual language. I mean, you can just look at the whole chapter of Acts chapter 2. And I mean, uh, verse 4, everyone heard them speak in his own language. Verse 6, and everyone there, over 13 languages, said, we do hear them speak in our tongues. Verse 11. I mean, so prayer is not speaking in tongues. You know, and you think about this. It's not, we have went into it. It's not some unknown language that not even you can understand. That's not profiting anybody. I mean, you could be cursing at God, and you have no idea. Are you going to blame that on the Holy Ghost in front at the judgment seat of Christ? God's going to say, you cursed at me. When? When you were supposedly praying. No, I was speaking in tongues, God, you know. Acts 2, 1 Corinthians 14, and... This is what people are going to say. And he's going to say, I, I wasn't controlling your tongue. You had no idea what you were saying. Something else was making you say it. Now, well, I don't know. We, we could park it there for just a moment. But I think I'm going to move on. A bit. What, what, what is prayer? Now, there's an acronym, I believe we went over it in the Institute with, with our students, there's an acronym, if you're ever wondering how to pray or what to pray, there's an acronym called ACTS, A-C-T-S. And just, if you're ever wondering how to pray or what a good method to pray is, it's adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Um, I got another list here, there's uh, confession, well, because you're a sinner, right? Thanksgiving, because you should be thankful for something. Everyone has something to be thankful for, right? You want to praise the Lord because He's worthy. That's something you can pray about right there. Uh, supplication, because people need your prayers. And you need things. And you're supposed to come boldly before the throne, uh, letting your petitions be made known unto God, right? And yet, you know, a lot of Christians they have that mentality. Oh, well, I never ask God for anything. He tells you to. He tells you to. You're not listening to Him then. You know, um, God asks questions in the Bible. You could do a whole study on that, on these questions that God asks, like, with Adam and Eve. He's like, where are you guys? You don't think God knew exactly where they were? He wanted them to admit where they were. You see? He wanted it to come, that confession out of the mouth. But you know, after you're praying and all that, and you've had the adoration, confession, thanksgiving, the supplication, and God speaks, then the next thing about prayer is actually listening to God. You know? Lord, would, would you speak to me now? Would you say something to me? Um, I think that one would probably get everyone in this room here. How much time do you actually spend just saying, Speak, Lord, thy servant here? That's in the Bible too. We forget that a lot of times. But as you have that constant prayer throughout the day, He'll speak. He'll speak to you. So we need, we need to yield on God in a place. See, sometimes we don't give God enough time to do something. Sometimes we're like, slide the credit card. Or sometimes we're like, medications. Or sometimes, uh, uh, I don't know. Okay, well, I don't understand what this paragraph here says, so... I'll just use a different Bible. You know, or... You see what I'm saying? I mean, you think of, you think about, uh, I guess, how you deal with your wife. You know? Yeah, I mean, she didn't get ready for church quick enough. What, are you just going to get a new wife? No. That'd be, that'd be ridiculous, right? 
No, you're going to endure. You're going to wait. You're going to see it through. And we need to yield on God in a place as well. Um, I'll, let me read a few verses if you want to scratch them down. Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. It says it twice. Psalm 37, 34 says, Wait on the Lord and keep His way. And He shall exalt thee to inherit the land when the wicked are cut off. Thou shalt see it. In Proverbs 20, verse 22, Say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and He shall save thee. God wants you to learn how to wait on Him. See, in this microwave Christianity society we have, we want to pop it in, put a minute or two, and get the finished product. And that's not how God works. You know, uh, I, I, got a, I got a guy that's trying to learn the Bible without laboring and study. He wants to just read a verse and understand it completely when the young man hasn't read the whole Bible even once. And see, God has set up the Bible in a fashion that it's reading you as you're reading it. This book is alive. It's breathing. And it, it pierces, dividing asunder between bone and marrow and and he knows the intents of your heart when you're even going to these pages. And it's not a lazy man's book. And if you're going in there looking for a pothole, you're going to find two. You know, and that's just how God's written it. You know, um, I'll give you a particular. I got a question, and it says, uh, What does heart mean in the Bible? And I don't know what the person was trying to uh, prove, but normally it's some type of eternal security. Or he doesn't want to believe in eternal security. So he's trying to find some verse that says, you know, if your heart's not perfect with God, you're going to burn in hell or something. So, you know, but I said, heart, you need to take into matters context, you know, uh, not just the verse, but the chapter, and then the book, and then the Bible as a whole. And then that word used throughout the Bible. You know, and he said, oh, well, that just sounds like twisting the scriptures. You're trying to make it say something it didn't say. And, and I, I shot him the verses saying that Jesus would be in the heart of the earth. See what I'm saying? It's not a regular human heart. You see? It's a heart of earth. It's, it's saying something different. But if you didn't know the whole Bible as a whole, if you didn't take a chance to look at a few verses and study to show yourself approved, you're not going to understand that heart doesn't always mean heart, like a human flesh heart. You know, and but unless you study, you're never going to find it. So back to the royal road of blessing. We're on the Joshua chapter 3 and verse 3. It says, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord, your God, and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Now there's street signs here on the royal road to blessing. You're required to go after them. He's putting these signs up on the road. You know, danger ahead. Or, you know, right turn only. Things like that. And uh, so it said, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and the priests and the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove your place and go after it. They just had to follow the ark of God. You know, and sometimes that ark goes into unpopular territory. Sometimes, uh, I mean, just like we're talking about, it goes into these uncomfortable places, and you're like, why would God ever bring me here? You know, I was listening to some on Final Fight, and they were talking about Billy Sunday's testimony, and what, when he was... Uh, Doing work for back then was a Presbyterian. No, no, it was the YMCA. It's the YMCA, and the guy's telling him he wants to give him a job, and he says, you know, part of this job, you're going to have to go into the saloons and give these men tracks. And I was thinking, now there's a ministry nobody does anymore. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Go into the saloons. <laughs> 
Now, if you're an alcoholic, it's probably not the best place for you to be. You see what I'm saying? But go into the saloons and give people tracks. Nobody touches that anymore. Hey, man, if the Lord put that on your heart, that's a whole new mission field that nobody even touches anymore. I mean, most of Christians today, they're in there drinking a beer with the guys, trying to witness. That's sad, man. No testimony, but then with the, uh, in verse 3, we see the raising of the ark. And that ark, man, was, was everything for them. They had to follow that ark. And the raising of the ark is this. You can never raise or praise God enough. That ark needs to be raised up in your life. You can, you can never be guilty of worshiping the Lord too much. You can never be uh, guilty of being too zealous for the Lord. You know what I'm saying? And I know people condemn it. Most, most Christians condemn it. But the fact is, you can never praise Him enough. Oh, if you want to turn that on, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm always hot in this place. Cool. But now we're in uh, verse 7. Verse 7, Joshua 3, 7, it says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. So, God was constantly reaffirming to Joshua that he was going to be on his side. And you need that, re you need to be, you need that reaffirmation from God as well. You know where God is reassuring you, saying, hey, Brother Saunders, you know, I mean, like I was with Billy Sunday, I'm going to be with you. You know, but think of the sacrifice Billy Sunday made. Are we willing to put in that kind of sacrifice? Or think of the sacrifice Moses made. Is Joshua now willing to put in that type of sacrifice? Even his family turned against him. You know, and you got to count the cost. But, you know, as you're on the rural road to blessing, it might not be easy, and people might wonder why you're on that road. Because it's not the easiest road. It's not the one with all the... You, you don't get the payment today. You get it at the end of the road. You know, you don't get it here on earth. You get it in heaven. And people are just going to look at you your whole life like you're just... like you got three eyes. You know? But will you stay focused on the royal road of blessing? You know, I, I had, a, I guess, one more point. We're running out of time, but there's defensive driving techniques on the royal road to blessing. And, you know, when I started driving, my mom said, act like everyone's drunk, Randy. Don't, don't believe a blinker. Don't believe anything. You know, stay out of their way, you know. Never demand the right of way. Just don't do it, you know. How about this? Submit to directions. You know, if, if the sign says this road closed, this road closed. Um, Joshua had to receive their instructions from God, the instructor. And he had to remember the instructions. He wasn't going to be much of a leader if he wasn't going to be receiving instruction. Um, it's like reading maps. It's like the Thompson... Thompson guy when you're out there on the road or today a GPS. I know Thompson guides are kind of old school, but we still use them in my job. But uh, that's like rightly divided. Like context and audience. Who's writing? Who's speaking? When you come to the Word of God, you got to take all that into account. And it's not going to come the first time you read the Bible, most of it. This is something that you understand as you're pouring through these pages. You're never going to learn everything there is about God. And I'm just talking about an English Bible. I'm just talking about an old-fashioned King James Bible. You're never going to learn all there is to learn in this thing. You don't even have to touch Greek. And you're already, you're already, man. You're, you're going to come short. And you're going you're gonna to need God to understand God's book. You can't always run to the Greek and the Hebrew. And I mean, hey, man, I'm... If it's not chopping up the Word of God, I don't see a problem with it. But I'm, most of the time when they're using it, they're saying, oh, a better rendition is this. And it's like, who are you, man? You just corrected the Bible, and you're not God. But 
I'm just talking about that English Bible. You got to submit to directions. This is the directions right here. You got to submit. You, you don't. You don't say. Uh, you know, if the arrow is pointing left, you don't get out of the car <laughs> and change the sign to point right. Oh well, I didn't want to go left, so I just changed the sign, or I just took the sign down, or I just spray painted over and made my own sign. And that's what the, a lot of people do with the Word of God, because they know what it says. But there's several street signs. There's the map, there's the mind, the men, and the means. There's a signal of hope. That's the reinforcement. There's the refuel station in the waters of Jordan. You know, I mean, you're going to need to get refueled at some point. And because if, if you're just living in the flesh, you're going to burn out. So anyway, I hope, hope you guys got something out of the roll road of blessings.